Hey, what's going on YouTube? What's happening everybody? All you mamma jammas out there. Welcome to or welcome back to Kovacs Corner. I appreciate you taking the time. Come through, check the video out. If you're a member, you're going to be able to see this a day in advance. If you want to get members, you'll be able to see the videos a day in advance, so on and so forth. Feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms down in the description below. And we're about to get into it. So I actually emailed uh, Nick at you, MTG. And I got his permission to allow me to react to his videos because we are getting back into Magic the Gathering. As you can tell, we got the hat for Magic the Gathering. Got it a couple years ago back when Worlds came to uh, Toronto and had a great time over there. But yeah, we got his permission to react to his videos. I've been watching his videos for a hot minute. I love to see the cheating allegations that go towards people and then they get caught on camera and I just love to witness that. So, without further ado, we're about to hop right into crazy MTG scandals that changed the game. Uh, feel free, subscribe, join Nikachu MTG, check him out, check out his homepage. Everything's going to be down in the description below. And yeah, we are about to get right into it. Bam. Hey, it's Nikachu, and today we are going to take a look at the greatest MTG scandals that happened in tournaments. So scandalous that it forced Wizards of the Coast to change the rules. In our first scandal, we've got Bob Huang versus Bradley Carpenter. Bob so this was at a huge tournament. I think uh, maybe about three, four years ago. I could be wrong, though is playing Goryo's Vengeance, and the plan is to reanimate really powerful creatures from the graveyard, starting with Grizzlebrand, which has an activated... G. Rose Vengeance. Return target legendary creature and card from your graveyard to play. That creature gains haste, remove it from the game, and at the end of the turn, uh, splice into Arcane. Cost 2 plus Swamplands. And then a legendary creature who is a demon, Grizzlebrand. He has flying, lifelink, pay seven life, draw seven cards. He's a seven seven creature, huge. An ability where you can pay seven life and draw seven cards. And after you gain more life with nourishing shoal, you can basically draw your entire deck to the You may exile a green card with converted mana cost X from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. You gain X life. Nice. It's like a life a life link point that you can reanimate Borborygmos in Rage, which nice. also has an activated ability of discarding a land and dealing three damage to target creature or player. This is how Bob intends on finishing off his opponent. Bradley, on the other hand, has a plan to beat this combo with Pithing Needle, which says as Pithing Needle enters the battlefield, name a card. Nice. Activated abilities of sources with the chosen name can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. All Bradley has to do is name the cards in Bob's deck. How hard is that? But you wouldn't be watching if everything went smoothly, so let's check out what happened. Bradley let's Carpenter, who is in fourth place on Abs and Company, who is currently 17th on our leaderboard, uh, is on the play for game two since he did lose game one. And, wow. we, and we see here Temple Garden, Pithy. He had that right off rip too, eh? Wow. Needle. I imagine he's just going to name Gristlebrand and just pass the turn and say, oh, all right, Bob, show me what you got. So it looks like he's, Bob's going to have to win here through the combat step. Yeah, this is going to be really tough for Bob. There's still ways that he can win, but the core engine of his deck, which is essentially drawing cards off Gristlebrand, has now been shut off. So Bradley's gone ahead and got a basic forest. Looks like he's going to cast this Pithy Needle. We'll get word what it's actually naming, but I'd be Back willing to guess that it's Borborygmos. Yeah, and Bob just nodded his head and said, sure, whatever. <laughs> yep. And there's the World Spine Worm that he left on top. And at this point, Bob does have a plan. He needs to get that World Spine Worm onto the battlefield, attack with it ASAP, and make a bunch of worms. And it looks like he did name Borborygmos. So we have Gristlebrand and Borborygmos named with these pithy needles, just like we thought was going to happen with Bradley's sideboard. Yeah, and Bob's got quite a few land drops. He's got that World Spine Worm in his hand. and. If he just can just get a hold of a, a desperate ritual, he could be off to the races with uh, a lot of green creatures in play all of a sudden. Yeah, so it looks like Bob did have a rules question away from the table. 
He's back. I imagine he was able to get the answer that he was looking for so that the World Spine Worm could potentially be a lethal attacker. Yeah, and even though Bradley doesn't have much of an offense, Bob doesn't actually have a lot of time. With that Kitchen Finks on the table, Bradley can threaten comboing off even off of just one collected company. So we'll have to see how things go here and how much time Bob actually has. Yep, now, it looks like uh, Bob does have a Simeon Spirit Guide in his hand. Uh, so really, if he happens to hit something like Desperate Ritual, he can cast that uh, uh, through the Breach next turn. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like Warcraft 3, as uh, Bradley here is just gaining information. As uh, pff, What a pull. <laughs> and that would be big game. So it looks like Bradley's just going to take the full seven. We're going to get a trigger off of Barbarigmos, revealing three. He's going to get two lands, and that spirit guide's going to hit the graveyard. So not only is this a good source of card advantage for Bob having just more land drops, it's also helping to fuel his graveyard, so he potentially gets more Goryeo's Vengeance targets. Let's see here, so... Bob did, Bob, Bob did already play a land this turn. Yep. Well, I'm sure that'll just be a, a quick judge call and they'll resolve it. Yeah, he, he, he missed his second land drop so that he could dis discard the Borborygmos. So the players will sort this out and... Oh, so if Borborygmos is named with Pithing Needle, I guess that doesn't actually stop oh. his ability because of the way that it's worded. Yeah, well, there are multiple Borborygmos. There's the original one that was in... Oh, did he name the wrong one? I think he might have just said Borborygmos. Ah. Wow. Well, Bob... Yeah, so it sounds like he just named Borborygmos, not Borborygmos Enraged. Wow. And there is another Borborygmos who is, you know, as we know, the leader of the Gruul Clan who was originally in Guild Pact, and it is legal and modern. Wow, extremely unfortunate. And you saw Bob Hoang's face when he won. He just... I imagine that, that was the, stole it and I imagine that was the judge question that yeah, Bob Lang might have had. That makes a lot of sense. So the card Bradley meant to name with Pithing Needle was Borborygmos Enraged, which is a card that has seen a lot of play as a win condition in multiple combo decks. However, Bradley named Borborygmos, which is a card that has never seen the light of day. That's Most funny. people don't even know this card exists. But That's hilarious. That's hilarious. So, like, the cheater named the wrong card pretty much had the scoop anyway. That's jokes. <laughs> Technically, because Borborygmos is a legal magic card in the format being played in this tournament, it has to be the one held by Pithing Needle. Therefore, Bob just casually reanimates Borborygmos enraged attacks and shoots Bradley down with lands. This That's ended up jokes. being like a really cheesy victory that triggered a lot of people on social media. And truth be told, Bradley's intent was to name the Borborygmos that was in Bob's deck, the one everybody knows about. So the rules regarding naming cards changed. You'd no longer need to be so specific so long as you and your opponent know exactly what you're talking about. And this includes describing the card even when you don't even know what the card is called. But I don't know about that, right? Because if you're in such conditions in a tournament, right, it should be the precise name overall judges sh should rule with that, especially if that was in the rules at the time. This is just my opinion about it, and I feel that some people will feel the same way, some people might, might not. It all it all depends, right? Because if you're a casual player, whatever, you can kind of let it go, but with this kind of stakes on the line, you know, you should be more precise while naming cards. I'm going to play Pithing Needle, and I'm going to name that uh, big creature that you reanimate, the one where uh, you discard lands and deal three damage to target creature or player. Now, our next scandal is going to involve a card called Dryad Arbor. It's technically a forest, one of the most basic resources in the game, but it just so happens to be a 1-1 creature. That means it can attack and it can block. The original printing for Dryad Arbor was very distinct. However, over time, they reprinted it with a new art 
and the giant mana symbol, and now it doesn't look all that much different from any other forest in the game. From a distance, Facts. they all look like the same damn thing, and that's gonna stir up some controversy. Maybe take your one hexproof creature away. There are a lot of good reasons <laughs> to, to want to have that ley line. And Gabriel Nassif here, reading that future sight printing of Daybreak Coronet. Plus three, plus three, Vigilance, Trample, oh sorry, Vigilance, Lifelink, and First Strike. The First Strike redundant at this point, the rest of it pretty important. Yeah, I like how the, the Boggles deck is basically you're just adding keywords to creatures, so it starts off with Hexproof, and you give it First Strike, and uh, Totem. Enchant creature with another aura attached to it, Enchant creature gets a plus three, plus three, and has First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink. Crazy. Marmor and uh, Vigilance, First Strike, Lifelink, and then you have a uh, Trample awesome with Rancor, Protection from Creatures, <laughs> Flying, and so on. Yeah, so currently a 5-5 coming in with First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink, and uh, of course Hexproof. Yeah, no, Bloodgust cannot block it, so I think Nassif has to decide if he wants to... Ha-ha! 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 Uh, chump with the flame blade at it, but I think he took damage, so he's gonna go down to four, and Thomas up to 15 now. So Gabriel Nassif on Hollow One is up against Thomas Langlot's Bogles. Thomas's strategy is very simple. Play a creature with Hexproof, which means the opponent cannot target it, and then suit it up with a bunch of aura spells. Currently, he has a Slippery Bogle, which is very dangerous. It's a 5-5 five, five with Vigilance, First Strike, and Lifelink. Nassif does have resources to push through damage. He's got Flame Wake Phoenix, which can fly over the Bogle okay. in the air. He also Plus has haste. Flame Blade Adept, which has the ability menace. of Menace, which means the opponent cannot block this creature unless they block with at least two or more creatures. And the Thief can only see one Bogle in play. So how can this plan go wrong? Kind of a, a tricky spot. I mean, essentially, it will mean that unless he feels like he can go so far over the top with his attacks, he might have to pump the brakes a little bit here. Yeah, and also remember that's a Dried Arbor, again. Tricky but quite relevant, especially in the face of something like the menacing uh, Flame Blade Adept. So I feel that this card should actually be up here on the field. If it's a 1-1 one, one creature, because you can see the 1-1 one, one right there, right? It's a 1-1 one, one creature, but it does have the mana on it. It should be up here, in my opinion, right? Like if, once again, a lot's on, on the line at stake, especially in a tournament, right? Little, little stuff like that should matter, in my opinion, especially when it comes to judges' rulings, right? So it'd be like, yeah, uh, you gotta play that up here so that it's known. But realistically, if you've been playing Magic for a long time, you should understand what your opponent is playing, what each card does, how the cards work, the abilities, so on and so forth, right? On the battlefield. Now it might be quite tough actually for uh, for Gabriel Nassif against that Daybreak Coronet. There we see the uh, From the Vault version of Dryad Arbor. Uh, it is it is a forest, but it is also a 1-1 creature. That meant that it came into play and did have Summoning Sickness, so it wasn't able to tap for mana that turn. But here comes uh, Burning Inquiry, and that means that each of these players drawing three and then discarding three, embracing the chaos, uh, Gabriel Nassif here. You know, maybe it'll work out that Thomas Langlots discards all the best cards in his hand. Yeah, we'll see about that. I mean, Thomas Langlots had quite a few lands and uh, use. Burning Inquiry, each player draws three cards, then discards three cards at random. So this lane line of Sanctity. So now we, uh, we're going to see what, what gets discarded. Boggle land land. Yeah, it's pretty good for, for long lots. And also, Nassif discarded another Phoenix that he could bring back right away, thanks to that Tasker. Mm -hmm. And also, remember, the, the Adept is pumped by quite a bit here. Yes. Yeah, Flame Blade Adept, definitely completely happy with more discards happening. Flame Wake Phoenix, and Flame Wake Phoenix haste. Hadn't really seen any play in any format before this deck came along, apart from, of course, if you happen to pick one up in draft. Mm -hmm. Faithless Looting, this will be more cards discarded. <laughs> Finds a lightning bolt, a hollow one. He can play that for free, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. I still, I'm still curious to see if he actually, um, if he sees the dried arbor. Because uh, if Nasif uh, brings back just the flame wake phoenix and attacks with everything, even if Thomas Langlois blocks the the adept, he's probably uh, Nasif probably still is getting through quite uh, for quite a bit of damage. We'll see soon enough, the dry diver being so important here. 
So he's bringing back the Phoenix and swinging with just those guys. Yep. Um, so I don't think he sees the Dried Arbor here. Yeah. Now he's like, what? <laughs> and I see the I see the hat, the famous yellow hat. And pro player Gabriel Nassif walked right into that one. Uh, Gabriel Nassif is hasn't seen it. He really hasn't. Yeah, I mean, that yellow hat has traveled the world with Gabriel Nassif. It, for a long while, it was his nickname on the Pro Tour because he was... It was so, so, like, little things like that, it can happen. It can literally, literally happen to anybody, especially if you're hyped to attack. This has to be blocked by at least two creatures. He's blocking with four. It'll get rid of this, but the two phoenixes will be able to attack because they have flying. So ubiquitous. And I love how he just keeps picking up the card as if it's going to change words or something. Nassif would lose this There's game, no but maybe not it. the war. For a long time, a lot of Magic players just wanted this art banned. It's just too deceptive. It's like when you go to the Wax Museum to take a picture of yourself with the Terminator, but it turns out to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. But <laughs> Wizards of the Coast came out with an even better ruling, and that is your card types need to be grouped up properly. Your lands need to be with your lands, but if like a I land said. happened to be a creature, it must be grouped up with your creatures. In our last scandal, there is a gross misinterpretation of the word combat. By announcing combat or go to combat, it allowed competitive magic players to shortcut themselves to a specific point of a turn. But here's the problem. If I laid out every step and phase of a turn of magic, untap, uh untap upkeep draw so like when you start your turn in mtg you got to untap everything right upkeep draw first main phase beginning of combat declare attacks declare blockers damage second main phase almost like in Yu-Gi-Oh. and announced combat what point of this turn do you think i want to go if you answered the beginning of combat you are absolutely wrong. The answer is the declare attacker step. Now that isn't true anymore today, but back then it was, and you might ask yourself, this rule doesn't make any sense. It was just a custom of competitive magic that you knew when you announced combat, go to combat, it meant that you wanted to declare your attackers, that you were ready to attack, to go to combat. But this rule finally met its match at the Pro Tour between Bien Wen and Cesar Segovia, where there would be this gross misunderstanding of the rule. Let's take a look at it. Cesar has a, one of the really cool cards in his deck, uh, Weldfast Engineer. Ooh. Uh, you know, not only is it is it a high draft pick, it's also very instrumental in this red-black deck by pushing in extra damage, being a 3-mana three 3-3 three, that essentially does two points of haste damage the first turn and two, two extra it? points uh, thereafter. <laughs> Teen says, do you mind if I read that? I, I didn't get that past pain in a draft earlier today. And what it can do here is it can actually make one of the Scrap Peep Scroungers into a 5-2 which me makes it attack without fear into that uh, Rishkar. So, uh, Cesar so also has the option of making Heart of Karen into a 4-4, then going to beginning of combat, making it into a 6-4, and then attacking with both Scroungers and the Heart. Team blocks a Scrounger, takes 9, falls down to 2, and then, and then is uh, very close to delivering lethal. Looks like Teen has a question here for a judge. Uh, he, he declared combat, and he's trying to crew. Okay, so is it correct you declare combat? Yeah. Legendary artifacts. Flying vigilance. Crew three. Tap any mana. Tap any mem. Uh, tap any member of creatures you control with total power three or more. This vehicle becomes an artifact creature until the end turn. You may remove a loyalty counter from a planeswalker you control rather than pay. Uh, the cost of the creature. Is it combat? Yeah, I guess. And Part of I cram. don't. Uh, uh, I try to. And then you crew it. Yeah. Okay, that's not allowed. Before you declare in combat, it means that you want to declare your attackers. That's how the shortcut works. Uh, if you did not crew your vehicle, uh, our policy is that you cannot crew your vehicle after you ask for combat. If you want to do an effect before attacking, you have to announce that before mentioning combat. Mm -hmm. Then I can do that. Crew? You cannot crew, no. Uh, but I, I uh, you have trigger. Well, he missed his trigger because 
No, no, I, I only say combat because I, it's the beginning of combat, and I don't try it here because I... Yeah, Cesar has a good point here. Yeah. So yeah, the I, way I this actually works is that after you end your main phase, there's a beginning of combat step where things like this trigger go on the stack, and he wanted to crew his vehicle in that. And, and the judge was saying that the standard shortcut is actually, when you say, I'm going to go to combat, is that you're saying, I want to go to my declare attacker step and right. skip over it. So Cesar's a... It, clarifying that with the judge, and we'll see how it ends up. His point is that he has a beginning of combat trigger, and he yeah. wants to crew with that trigger, uh, presumably still on the stack, if he's going okay. to that. Mm -hmm. That's okay, that's not an issue. So if it's worded like that for the trigger, he would have to do the way how he played it, right? And gross misunderstanding. It's a fact. But it, what happens after? Yeah, the, nothing else. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned declare attackers. Um. It's a trigger, man. Okay. Though, if he's in his beginning of combat with Heart of Kiran uncrewed, he can't target Heart of Kiran with the Weld Pass Engineer ability, uh, though he can target a Scrap Heap Scrounger, which Needs may be the play rep. he wants to make anyway. Yes. So, the situation is this Cesar wants to go to the beginning of combat step. Mind you, English is not his first language, and he says, combat what else could this mean fian agrees all right go to combat so cesar thinks he's in the beginning of combat he's going to get a trigger off of the weld fast engineer which says at the beginning of combat on your turn target artifact creature you control gets plus two plus zero until end of turn and while he's at it he wants the crew and from thian wen's perspective he's like hey you declared combat. You're going to your declare attacker step, and now you're trying to crew? That's too late. You can't do that. The first thing you do at your declare attacker step is you got to attack. You're not allowed to activate and crew the heart of Kieran at that point. So he has every right to call a judge. No takesies backsies at the pro tour. But Cesar is like, no, I didn't mean to go to my attacker step. I, I said combat because I want to go to the beginning of combat step. Look, look at the Wildfast engineer. It says combat on the card. I think Cesar's intentions are incredibly clear, and I, it's not even like the opponent can do anything about it. The end is completely tapped out. But instead of being an easy fix, this turns into a real mess. It appears to be a real you mess. You are proposing a shortcut to declare attackers. You say combat it means you want to declare attackers. So at this point, this trigger is missed. You forgot because you are declaring attackers. This cannot be true. The smugness, the smugness on this dude's face, man. Like, you have to understand, if someone's first first language is not English, and they're here, and they're competing, and they're trying to use the English language to the best of their capabilities, and obviously he's reading it from the cards, that... Pff, it all depends. Because, once again, stakes, competition, phrasing and wording do mean things when it comes to that and like any tournament pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh, magic the gathering digimon like anything right one piece whatever uh, that would be a tough call i can see that they have a second third judge here as well uh they might have to deliberate about the whole situation as he's explaining to him well you kind of missed that trigger you didn't you didn't initiate that trigger and in his head, he's like, but I was reading the card, and that's what the card says, and I'm pretty sure that because this is how I've been playing the tournament, this is the first time I'm actually having problems, like, declaring this attribute of the card, right? I can say any attacker. At this point, you are in declare attackers. So you have to point to the creatures that are attacking. All right, so you, you can hear what the judge is saying. I would not be shocked if we had an appeal here that does happen quite often, though. Spanish? I can, I can collect one. Sure. Sorry, actually requesting a Spanish-speaking judge, which is yes. also a very good idea. That's a good idea, too. Just, making Just sure, to making make sure, sure you're communicating clearly. Yeah. So at this point, Cesar must think, this is bullshit. Do you guys not even understand the words coming out of my mouth? I said combat which means go to my beginning of combat step. What Fact. else could it mean? What is so hard to understand here? Get me a Spanish speaking judge. And it looks like what we've got is what Cesar had uh, 
re requested, which is a Spanish-speaking judge. Just to be clear, this is a very fine interaction that we're talking about here, and there's a lot of uh, minutia that is, is actually quite important to a ruling like Now, you can see on our lower left, just by way of update on uh, our main table, that's uh, Toby Elliott. He's our head judge here for the weekend, and so... So in the end, Cesar had to play on and ended up losing that game. Apparently, going to combat doesn't mean going to combat. However, there is some justice in the world, and Cesar did make a comeback in games two and three to win the entire match. But as a result of... Hold on. Hold on. Cesar did make a comeback in games two and three to... Weakest handshake ever. Weakest handshake ever. I'd be like, hold on, bro. Nah, man. Nah, man. I don't. I, nah. That weak ass handshake, bro. To win the entire match. Beedle. But as a result of this match, the rules got rewritten. And now, if you mention combat, it can only mean you are going to the beginning of combat step. It no longer is a shortcut to your declare attacker step. So which of these scandals is the most ridiculous? Let me know in the comments section below. If you've ever been cheesed out by the rules, maybe something that could be changed. Also let me know in the comments section below. Smash like for fixing the rules and don't forget to subscribe to my channel or all the magic judges will move to Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> but yeah, no man, let me know your thoughts and how you feel about it down in the comments as well. And if you play MTG, if something like that has ever happened to you in a high stakes competition, uh, yeah, video link, also creator page is going to be down in the description below. Make sure that you go and check out Nikachu. Uh, thanks to him for allowing me to do a reaction to his videos, which is dope AF. I appreciate that very much. And feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms. Feel free to join the Discord, send memes, other videos that you might want me to react to over there. And yeah, man, think about becoming a member if you'd like to. Other than that, have yourselves a good one, and I'll see you in the next one, man. Peace.